Testing microphone, microphone test.
with the motivation of bodhicitta, which is the path of all beings in that space, must be brought to the achievement of perfect Buddha, and that is in order, and in order to bring that about, that you will listen to the Buddha. of the refuge of Bodhisattva Vats, which we began yesterday. And uh, one thing I, yeah, to do. The next situation has been difficult. I can turn the air conditioning on. Um, it's the air conditioning. Yeah, maybe it's turned off. Yeah, that doesn't help either. <laughs> but I guess we'll, uh, it's pretty cool in here, so maybe we'll turn it off. I think we're going to try again now that the AC is off and it's a little quieter. Um, so good morning and welcome to everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And uh, good morning to all my Dharma friends here and also online. So um, of course we should set our motivation. So please listen with the motivation of Bodhicitta, which is the thought that all beings throughout space must be brought to the achievement of perfect Buddhahood, and that it is in order to bring that about that you will listen to the Dharma. So today we're going to continue 
our discussion of the refuge and Bodhisattva vows, which we began yesterday. Hopefully, everybody has a copy of the handout. Try to make sure they remember. And uh, one thing I'd like to announce uh, this morning is that Lama Tato agreed to grant the refuge and Bodhisattva vows uh, to those who would like to take them. So may I ask, maybe a show of hands, is there anyone here who would like to take either the refuge or the Bodhisattva vows? Um, can I ask, I'll ask your name and then which vow? Um, your name? And you want to take Bodhisattva. Is it possible to take the householder vows that you mentioned? Uh, we can ask them to. Uh, I don't think that should be a problem. Okay. Uh, your name? Michael. Okay. Do you need a mask? Um, sure. It's N I R. Okay. E N B E R G. Okay. And that's the same, and that's the impossible yes. vow. Okay. Yes. And what would you like to take? Refuge and Bodhisattva Oh, both, okay. Um, yes. Current. Uh, H-A-W-K-A. No, it's H-A-W-K. And what would you like to take? Bodhisattva and Leiva. Anybody else to use? Yes. Okay. I kind of don't understand what, like, if you're supposed to take both of them at the same time, or you should use weight, or like, is it up to you to feel at what point, like, in your education, are you to take them? I want to take it seriously, not just like, oh, this is a great opportunity to take care right now. So, um, I not understand a little bit, like, where am I supposed to be within all of that if I've been. Like my own practice, and also like what is recommended, and like I don't know how maybe your own what how we how long did you take when did you take them or maybe you're not the best. <laughs> like, what do people usually take? Um, you don't have to take them both at once, What's and I would recommend maybe the refuge bath first, and then taking the bodhisattva vow when you feel like you'd like to. And you, um, you don't have to take them together if you don't want to. It is up to you. That some people do take them together, and you would, you would, you would recommend that. I'm just maybe I need to ask. You could ask him if you want to. It's a little bit of a jump. Yeah, that's I might not recommend it. Yeah. Okay, so let's start. Sounds good. Thank you. Is that everybody who wants to take anything? Uh, I'll pass it along and let him know. It's lucky that he's here. <laughs> I was worried because giving these, maybe people might get inspired, and then if Lama Chathup's traveling or something, then you just you might have to, you have to take them in person, so you maybe would have to come back or, or find a different Lama to do. But it worked out. It's great. Um, let's see. I imagine he said he could give them today. Um, we'll ask him when. Most likely after the afternoon session. Does that work for everybody? Ten minutes? Okay, great. All right, great. So that's good. Um, so yesterday we paused at the refuge and bodhisattva vow found in the Kagyumaman prayer book. And that's um, on page nine of the handout. Okay. So... Let's open up to page nine. Um, would someone be willing to read it, the prayer on page nine? Um, there's two, so you read the first and you can read the second. Okay. Yeah, the fir uh, I'd like you guys to read the first and the second. Um, is that all my mothers? Yes. All my mothers, all things we have today especially the enemies who beat me, obstructors who harm me, and all those who obstruct my liber liberation and on my part. 
omniscience. Um, omniscience. omniscience. Um, must have happiness. Be free from suffering and quickly attain precious, unsurpassable, complete, and perfect awakening. For that purpose, until Buddhahood, I will employ my body, speech, and mind in virtue. Until death, I will employ my body, speech, and mind in virtue. From today until this time, tomorrow, I will employ my body, speech, and mind in virtue. Right, thank you very much. So, in this prayer, we can see the speaker committing themselves to benefiting all beings by becoming someone who can actually help others. This means that they are striving to better themselves so that they can help others. As I mentioned yesterday, there is an English word that closely relates to this idea, and it's called altruism, which is defined as the principle or practice of unselfish concern or devotion to the welfare of others. Venerable Ringu Tukurumpache describes the word bodhicitta in his book, The Lazy Lama Looks at Bodhicitta, Awakening Compassion and Wisdom. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention that this is a really nice series. So if anybody's looking for further reading, I think uh, Ringu Tukurumpache's uh, The Lazy Lama series are very nice. Uh, I also relied on uh, the Lazy Lama Looks at Refuge, Finding a Purpose and a Path. Um, so these are like concise uh, treatments on these particular topics, and I found them to be very helpful. So you could take a look at that if you wanted. And we'll be hearing a lot of these books today, so I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, and so in this book, it states, <clears throat> Bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word that literally means mind of awakening. We can think of bodhicitta as a natural extension of refuge. Taking refuge means deciding to work towards fulfilling our own potential to transform our own experience and become free from fear and suffering. While developing bodhicitta, um, while developing bodhicitta expands our aim and practice to include all other beings. It is basically a kind of great compassion, which is combined with understanding or wisdom. While compassion generally means wishing that a being may be free from suffering, bodhicitta is that same wish combined with an understanding of the possibility of its actually being fulfilled. The compassion and wisdom aspects of bodhicitta, also termed relative and ultimate bodhicitta, need to be developed simultaneously. They are like two wings of a bird. If you cultivate one without the other, you'll be like a bird with only one wing going around in circus. So we can understand bodhicitta as both expanding and applying the refuge vow. <clears throat> it expands the wish to attain and out to include all beings along with yourself. It also establishes the commitment to carry it out. Rinpoche introduced two important terms, which are relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. Luckily for us, he provides an explanation. Relative bodhicitta. Relative bodhicitta can be described in terms of a great compassion, which is limitless in four ways, called the four immeasurables. The first immeasurable is the wish that all suffering, without exception, may be utterly extinguished. Secondly, we are not just talking about all the suffering of one person or a few people, but all the sufferings of all sentient beings, not just human beings, but every single sentient being or whatever kind of whatever kind throughout all existence. Thirdly, it is not enough just to wish that all sentient beings without exception have no suffering, but also we wish that they may all attain unlimited perfect well-being or peace or freedom. Finally, we don't just wish that all beings may have a measurable happiness or well-being temporarily, but forever, immutably. 
So there is no limit to our aspirations and no inequality or partiality. We're not saying, well, okay, I'd like everyone to be free from all their problems, but I want some, such as my friends or family, to do better than others. So that's the impartiality part of it. In that description, certain ideas from yesterday are evoked, such as making limitless aspirations, even if they are more wonderful than we've ever witnessed or experienced. In terms of making virtuous aspirations, one should never hold back. Sky's the limit, as they say, but even that could be surpassed. In order to create or do something we've never done, we need to dream it and believe it or will it into existence. So why would we put a limit on our dreams? Ringo Rinpoche also mentions that bodhi, bodhicitta should not be partial. It should be felt equally across all beings. This does not mean you love your loved ones any less. It means you are extending that title or designation of loved one to all beings. Again, this is supported by the recognition that all beings have at one point been our own kind mother who birthed, nurtured, and protected us. Just because she may not have taken just because she may have taken another form and no longer performs that role of our mother in this particular life does not negate or diminish the fact that she once did. Turning back to the text. We combine this ideal compassion with an understanding of how it is possible for us to work towards transforming ourselves and therefore by extension of how it is also possible for others to do likewise. The next step is to develop a strong sense of purpose or intention, which includes a feeling of personal responsibility. I will work towards this aim, motivated by the compassionate wish to be able to help others to do the same. In the Buddhist tradition, a person who has developed such a sense of purpose very deeply is called a bodhisattva. Bodhi means knowledge, wisdom, awakening, or enlightenment while sattva means one who has courage, has heart, or has aspiration. Therefore, a bodhisattva is someone who has the heart <laughs> to work towards enlightenment, the ultimate freedom for the sake of all beings. It is a great aspiration which calls for a tremendous courage and determination. There is a kind of heroic dimension to it. Such a person is a hero. Whatever we want to do in life, the first step is to have an aspiration. If we have an aspiration, we will naturally start to work towards fulfilling it, whether more or less, consciously or unconsciously. This is why it is considered so important to admire the bodhisattva ideal and to start cultivating the beginnings of a bodhicitta aspiration within ourselves. Even just a thought of it would be a very strong practice. While to succeed in actually generating a genuine bodhicitta aspiration, would be a tremendous, wonderful achievement. Of course, we must accept that we may not really be great bodhisattvas right now. Even if I have taken the formal bodhisattva vow, it doesn't mean that I have become an amazing bodhisattva. It means I have made a commitment saying that I would like to become a bodhisattva and would like to start to work on the bodhisattva path. I haven't suddenly become some kind of saint completely free of selfishness and anger. That doesn't happen so easily. So we start by trying to work in this direction, little by little, first generating some loving kindness as expressed in the traditional prayer, which by the way, is also in the prayer book that we chanted this morning, the four measurables. Here are a couple lines of it. May all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. This allows our attitude towards ourselves and others to become a little softer, more open. Ideally, we try to have a spirit of kindness and helpfulness towards everyone, or at least, even if we are unable or don't want to help, we don't bear them any ill will. We wish that they may meet no suffering and may attain all the good things they desire. So uh, this type of bodhicitta, is called aspirational bodhicitta, where the practitioner develops altruistic aspirations like cultivating, cultivating the four immeasurables, such as measurable love, immeasurable compassion, 
a measurable joy, and a measurable equanimity. In fact, if we'd like, we can take a look at it in our prayer book. Yeah, page three. So at the bottom of page three, the prayer titled The Four Immeasurables has four lines. And the first line says, may all sentient beings gain happiness and the cause of happiness. This is cultivating immeasurable love, immeasurable love for all sentient beings, that you wish that they gain happiness and the causes of happiness. The second line, may they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. Some people say causes. In Tibetan uh, and English, the plural is a bit ambiguous. So may they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. This helps you to cultivate immeasurable compassion, wishing that they never suffer. Then the third line, may they never be separated from the highest bliss, which is devoid of suffering. And by this feeling and by this prayer, you cultivate immeasurable joy. And then the fourth, may they come to rest in great impartiality, some people say equanimity, which is free of attachment and aversion. So that's where you wish that just as you are cultivating the ability to be impartial, to not hold some closer and hold some further, to not wish good for some, and hopefully not ill will, but less good for others. So in trying to overcome that habit, you also wish that others as well could rest in great equanimity, which is free of attachment and aversion. So it's nice to, nice to kind of know what we're trying to, um, you could say, inspire within ourselves uh, when we read these prayers. Especially since um, we read them in Tibetan. At some centers, they do English and Tibetan, and I find that can be helpful. And maybe in the future, we could try to incorporate that more possibly. Um, of course, you're always welcome to read the translation, but it's nice sometimes to, to take a little time to uh, not only read the translation, but also to try to look into um, the reason for why we recite the prayer in the first place. So there's that. There is another type of relative bodhicitta. So the two facets of relative bodhicitta, the first being aspirational, setting the proper aspiration and perfecting the aspirational bodhicitta would be endlessly cultivated, those four immeasurable feelings. Notice love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Those are types of feelings that you feel within yourself. And that's what you want to increase more and more. The counterpart or the companion would be aspirational bodhicitta. Some call it, hmm, there's another word. Um, did I say that? I meant the counterpart is application of bodhicitta, or you could say actualized bodhicitta, uh, and that's where you carry it out. So aspirational bodhicitta has to be paired with application of bodhicitta, and um, that is uh, the perfection of which, or the execution of which is, you could say, not just idealized, but the, the different aspects of carrying it out are called the six perfections. So when we say the six perfections, they are the six perfections or the six different qualities of perfecting application of bodhicitta. And you've heard them before. They are first being generosity, second being morality, the third being patience, the fourth being effort, the fifth being concentration, and the sixth being wisdom. So these are the qualities that can directly benefit yourself and others. And um, the first type of bodhicitta, the aspirational, sets up the intention to help others, and the second carries it out, as I mentioned. So um, those are the two parts of relative bodhicitta.
Rinpoche states, helping others with bodhicitta motivation doesn't only mean helping in obviously spiritual ways or overlooking the little everyday things to focus only on the grand ultimate goal of total liberation or enlightenment. It means helping in many ways for great and small and long-term and short-term benefits. <clears throat> Just as I want everything to go well for me, whether in large or small matters, lasting or temporary, so does everybody else want that for themselves. And we try to help in every way we can. What we actually do to help is not necessarily the most important aspect of the Bodhisattva path. The intention or attitude underlying what we do is regarded as more important because that becomes the basis, the motivation for all our actions. If you have the bodhicitta motivation, then whatever you do will be of help because your whole purpose is to use whatever resources you have in a way that is beneficial to you and to others. We can use only whatever circumstances and methods are available to us at any moment, but as long as we have the clear intention of helping others and ourselves, we can make good use of whatever understanding we have and whatever means we can muster at that time. Anything we do that is good for ourselves and for others is a positive act. And if we do it with the wish that we may become able to do more, to gain more understanding and wisdom, and to become more effective, then we are moving towards a bodhisattva attitude. Sometimes people mistakenly think that compassion may be all right for others, but is not so good for oneself. If I'm too compassionate and helpful, people will take advantage of me because they see me as a pushover. But, Compassion means wanting the best for everyone, including oneself. And I don't have to try to do everything everyone else. I do as much as I can. But if I can't help, then I can't help. But even if I can't actually help now, I can maintain the wish to be able to help in the future. This is the Bodhisattva's skillful means of training. It isn't necessarily skillful to just give everything away. And here's a funny story. There is a rather horrible story, which illustrates this point. A man who generated the wish to become a great bodhisattva made a vow to give people whatever they wanted. He would never refuse anybody anything they asked for. So of course, everybody came and asked for this and that. And as he was a rich man, he could give them whatever they wanted. This went on for quite some time until one day a particularly difficult person came along and asked if it was really true that he would give whatever was asked of him. That's right, I'm a bodhisattva. I'm happy to give whatever they want. Then give me your right hand, the man said. The bodhisattva didn't hesitate. He asked for a knife and cut off his right hand and gave it. But the man refused to accept it. In fact, he was furious. This is because the rich man, having cut off his right hand, had to offer it with his left hand. In India, the left hand is regarded as unclean. They're very particular about it. You can't even pass the salt or pepper with your left hand. People won't take it. You can't give me something with your left hand. That's disgusting, the man shouted. And according to the story, the would-be bodhisattva was so shocked and discouraged by this incident that he abandoned his efforts altogether. People are impossible to please, he said. That's the end of my bodhicitta. So, <laughs> it was a useless thing to do, just giving unintelligently, without discriminating between what was and wasn't beneficial. And practicing compassion shouldn't be like that. I think it is also important to understand that practicing compassion doesn't mean just trying to please people. It's trying to be helpful to benefit others, to improve matters. If somebody asked you to do something destructive, like, please break my leg, you wouldn't say, sure, why not? I never say no, would you? So it's like that. It's not just being nice and doing whatever people ask, but intelligently wanting to help. Maybe someone, perhaps a child, might benefit from being scolded. 
It isn't being unkind to them. It's actually being kinder than just giving in to whatever they demand. Of course, it may mean they won't like you very much at that moment, but it is no good wanting to be liked by everybody. That isn't the idea. Another point we need to be clear about is that our practice of compassion is not dependent on whether or not we like the other person. Sometimes people think that it is impossible to be compassionate towards all beings because we can't like all beings. Of course we can't like everybody. How can I like people who have been harming others? I can't like them or admire them, but still, I don't need to wish them harm. Rather, I can wish that they would change and would stop harming themselves and others. I can wish that they could find peace and freedom from their painful and destructive states of mind. It is possible to do that for everyone, even those who have done terrible things to others. We could say that kindness to others is based on our kindness towards ourselves. If we don't know how to wish ourselves well, how can we wish others well? I think it is a mistake to criticize ourselves for wanting our own well-being. If we wish ourselves and others well, what can go wrong? Everyone benefits. Whatever I do, I try to see whether it will be good for myself now and later, and good for others now and later. If, as far as I can see, it seems to be all right, then I'll do it. If I see that it may seem advantageous for me, but would be harmful to others, then I look for another, less damaging way of doing it. And if I see that it may be good for others, but would be very harmful to me, then I also try to avoid it. Perhaps sometimes there could be a great benefit to others at some cost to myself. Then it's up to me to judge whether I'm ready to sacrifice some of my own interests for the sake of others. If I can make that sacrifice without too much regret, then all right, I can do it. But if I find that I would regret it too much, then I would do better to acknowledge that I'm not yet ready for it. I think it's very important to know one's own limits. It doesn't help to overextend yourself and regret what you've done. You also need to grow and strengthen your own practice responsibly so that you can continue to progress. For example, if you were training yourself to be a weightlifter and the first week you could lift 50 pounds, the second 60 and the third 70, you would be making steady and gradual progress. But if you tried on the fourth week to lift 100 pounds and so forced yourself beyond your ability, you could break your arm, which would prevent you from training for a long time. This might cause you to lose all the progress you had been steadily making and could even inhibit you from weightlifting ever again if the injury was severe. Even if the injury was not severe, you might lose your interest in weightlifting altogether and abandon the sport, just like the rich man abandoned bodhicitta. Therefore, engaging in any practice irresponsibly, or one could say engaging in malpractice, does not render good results. Moreover, engaging in the malpractice of bodhicitta could jeopardize your healthy and strong progress along the bodhisattva path. Therefore, it's better to use discretion and be honest with yourself about where you are and your own limitations. That being said, you can and must always maintain an altruistic attitude towards all beliefs. Rinpoche Rinpo Rinpo continues. The more we become accustomed to doing something, the more our ability to do it improves. This applies both physically and mentally, doesn't it? We can train ourselves through practice to become stronger. The more we practice compassion and goodwill, the easier it becomes. It is the same with becoming accustomed to any feelings or states of mind, whether worry and anger or joy and peacefulness. For example, we try to feel peaceful and relaxed when we practice meditation, and that is part of the training. Training in the spiritual path means practicing, exercising, again and again. It's like cultivating a habit. 
If you do something often enough, it becomes your habit. And eventually, as your habit becomes stronger, it becomes second nature. According to Buddhist teachings, <clears throat> and this is born out, and this is borne out by the experience of many great masters, we are in fact basically all right at our deepest level in our true nature. Our distorted way of perceiving and relating to the world and all our problems have come about due to our conditioning. This conditioning is habitual in a way, and we can take a first step towards overcoming it by cultivating a different habit. The habit of being kind, relaxed, peaceful, and joyful. And the more we do it, the more accustomed to it we'll become, and the easier it will be. <clears throat> Until our compassion and wisdom become so strong that we will be ready for anything. So we start by working at our own level, not expecting too much of ourselves to begin with, but acknowledging our shortcomings and wanting to develop our positive qualities because we can see that to do so will be good for us and others. So at this point, I thought it might be nice to have a little bit of discussion about cultivating. And I'm kind of coming up with this question on the fly, but I wanted to have a question here. All of you in the course of your spiritual practice, and that may or may not be Buddhist per se, but in your spiritual practice, have you ever experienced how cultivating a particular mind state um, got easier over time? Or did you ever face any challenge where trying to establish a certain type of way of thinking was difficult in the beginning, but became easier over time? Should I read the book? Um, for instance, um, in reading recently the Mahamudra, um, that was a pathway to um, a breakthrough in um, writing and understanding past experiences and um, reading aloud the writing and understanding new words such as animism and having the responsibility of passing on photographs of people's relations who passed away and having the responsibility of posting them in social media and further experiences of witnessing just yesterday a bear on a tree on my meditative walk. Um, just absolute um, part of meditation and um, participating in the experience of Bodhicitta itself. Oh, nice. Did uh, seeing the bear relate to Bodhicitta at all? Um, I believe so, because I was contemplating how I um, was healing from an experience of how to deal with um, Uh, participating in communication for other people and healing from a past experience with um, confusion of feelings of residue, anger, and forgiveness. And the bear was on the tree and I was staring at it and I had to I was on the road, bears in the forest, <laughs> and it was unusual because I uh, was moved to clap and give warning as instructed on Overlook Mountain what to do when seeing the bear. It was dealing with my fear and also um, being mesmerized by communicating with the bear because the bear is so vocal, vocalized, is communicating with me. It is very overwhelming. That sounds like an interesting experience. Sounds like it brought up a lot. Yeah. 
Here's this um, point that Rindu Tudu makes. Maybe I'll uh, sound it out again. Training the spiritual path means practicing, exercising again and again. It's like cultivating a habit. If you do something often enough, it becomes your habit. And eventually, as your habit becomes stronger, it becomes second nature. So I guess what I'm asking is, have any of you felt this way? Like when I'm doing my daily practice, um, whatever level of this I am, when I'm doing that, I feel like I'm cultivating the practice of this. You know, I'm mm-hmm. very busy for so long. A lot of it is you know, cultivating that habit, but what I really am trying to cultivate is that I'm beyond that, like a compassion and devotion. That's not, it's when I live more like. In my practice, when I struggle with um, like some feeling of inadequacy or I'm doing it wrong, which like, Americans tend to do a lot of things wrong when it comes to spiritual practice. But when I rely on the guru, you know, that's in any way of what he's found, and when it's much, it, it comes more naturally, more intuitively, to be able to cultivate um, whatever. Wonderful. Mm. I don't know if you meant to do this or not, but um, in your answer, I'm noticing a really important uh, dependent relationship. You started out with saying that it can be difficult to cultivate discipline, especially when it's going against habits. Um, And for me, this makes me think of uh, my habitual laziness. So not wanting to do the practice I'm supposed to be doing, maybe not trying hard enough to do the accumulations I should be doing, I'd rather watch a TV show, those types of things. Um, and how by sticking with it and cultivating discipline, from that, from that basis, from the basis of actually making yourself do what you're supposed to do, such as your daily practice, then other feelings can arise, such as compassion and devotion. So by establishing discipline, you're enabling those other feelings to arise, which is really important. So that shows us how important discipline is because otherwise, you know, if we're watching a TV show, that may not give us such a good opportunity for the feelings of compassion and devotion to arise in the first place. And then you mentioned fears and struggles that come up in your mind, feelings of doubt. But that how remembering the guru can kind of help to counteract those fears. And um, that's a wonderful way of, that's one wonderful aspect of the blessing of the guru. It's not like anything has changed, but somehow in remembering the guru, you no longer feel those feelings. Like they kind of just fade away.
someone knocks here, they go all the way out. This is pretty much told me that the best piece of advice I was thinking to do. And so I just started to simplify and do it more, and that really helped me um, have the discipline to do shamatha and further um, other practices. And um, another habit that what I've learned on and off, of course, and so um, not practicing what I preach these days now, but that was the smoking cigarettes. Like, well, you are smoking. It seems like there is no other way to live life without smoking. But it only lasts four days, four terrible days. And then you have to learn to slowly um, get away from the cues and the helps you, whatever helps you now, take that out. It feels like you have a solid state of mind, this is solid space that like, there can be no other way. That's it, it's the right path. And if you even attempt to try to do anything, it feels like it's going to shatter. To me, it feels like something's going to die, that terrible feeling, but really, I don't like that. <laughs> In the life of like being here, you can have this form so. That's great. Those are great examples. And in fact, they're kind of like uh, two sides of the same coin. Because the first one, you're trying to, the difficulty of establishing a new habit. And the second one was the difficulty of breaking an old habit. They're, they're both actually kind of, they have their own difficulty. Um, but the first one, there's a saying. I don't know if it's a Tibetan saying, but a Tibetan lady told it to me. Um, all good things are difficult in the beginning, but are easier later on. And all bad things are easy in the beginning and difficult later on. So if something is hard to do, but it's a good type of thing, then I think it shows that putting your time and energy into it is going to cultivate something good, or bear something good, just like um, like tilling a field. A lot of work in the beginning, but it cultivates a lot of fruit. Do you have something? Yeah, I have. Um, I've just developed like methods over the, um, over the years because I'm like so, uh, my brain is so resistant towards doing things. Especially um, anything involving like the active discipline. Um, and so I have to trick myself into, into doing things constantly. So anything involving practice, I just like want to lay out like literally what I do. I, I um, if I haven't practiced or if I've lost the habit of practicing, what I have to do. Is I have to like create a baseline, yeah. and so I'll say practice for 20 minutes, but I can't practice for 20 minutes really, really, really. I have to practice for 20 minutes a day, every day. And it's like, if I can't do that, if my mind starts freaking out, it's like, then do 10 minutes every day. And if I can't do that, then it's like, okay, do five minutes every day, but it has to be every day. And then from that five minutes, I'll do that for a week. And it's like, okay, now it's time to increase one minute every day. And if I get impatient, it's like, no, only one minute. It's like, but I want to do 10 minutes now. It's like, no, you have to do one minute increase. And then I get to 10 minutes. And then do that for a week. And then increase one minute. And then do that for a week. Then increase. So it's just, kind of, or, you know, whatever pace works, but it's just, um, it's like the most important thing for me is consistency. It's always consistency. It's not how much I could do today and tomorrow I don't do, you know, today I do an hour, tomorrow I do five minutes. It's kind of like, you know, if I slowly focus on building this base, strong base, each level I find myself, you know, it's like when, when I get to an hour after practicing consistently for two months, it's extremely solid. And so I, uh, so if for some reason I have a family emergency, 
and I have to not practice for several days, I can easily return to that solid base once I get back to my life. And um, and that's just like, you know, it's like this mixture of, it is like, a, it's just like patience um, in dealing with habits uh, seems to work after like a lot of experimentation um, because I can't just turn it on. Um, yeah, it doesn't, you know, it's like my mind can be like quite vicious if I try to do that. And it, uh, it does not want to do that. So it's like all about just playing tricks. So it's, really, it's like tricking myself into doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think probably a lot of us can relate to that. Yeah. And uh, I like what you said about patience and dealing with habits. We do have to be patient in dealing with habits. I mean, we form habits over a long period of time. So naturally, we'll break habits over a long period of time. Kind of like going into a tube and coming out of a tube. Like it, it, it's going to be equivalent. Whatever energy you put into some, something is the same amount of energy it's going to take to undo it. Yeah. For me, it makes me think of jogging. Like if I'm, if I'm doing really well with jogging and then I stop, for like two weeks, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I won't be able to jog in the same way. It's also with like, a, if you want to go to the gym, working with the mind is for me is like not unlike that. Like there's actual, if you if you haven't gone to the gym in two years, you try to go bench press, you know, max weight, even it's half weight, yeah. you're gonna, you're gonna, you might actually hurt yourself. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, like going in, the, the mind for me is no different. So. Yeah. It kind of, it, it reminds us of a lot of those feel-good movies where, like, somebody gets their chops back, you know, like someone's, like, a famous guitar player, but then, like, something happened and he didn't play for a long time and he, like, was winning Grammys, but, like, now he, like, can't even get through a song and he's got to, like, work himself back up to it. Yeah, the montage training scene. Yeah, yeah. montage. And all. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we can all relate in terms of, you know, establishing habits, um, how to break down negative habits and all of that. I think, therefore, if we believe in that, then actually, if we think of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and all of their excellent qualities and how wonderful they are in so many ways, how it seems like, oh, maybe they, it's like to think like, oh, but like, oh, it's easy for this Rinpoche because like he never has a negative thought. And it's a lot harder for me, and I'll, I'll never become like them. But that's discrediting all the work that they've done for a very long time in order to become like that. And that type of mindset doesn't help. So if it's like the first time you've ever skied, and then you see these Olympic skiers, and you think like they're just beyond like my comprehension, they're just on some level I could never ever get to. Um, but at some point, they skied for the first time, so they've been training and developing uh, probably uh, very diligently for a very long time. So likewise, we could do the same thing in terms of our spiritual practice. And I mean, it's wonderful. So if you see these wonderful teachers and bodhisattvas and these Buddhas, and you see all their wonderful, incredible qualities, they're so inspiring, wouldn't it make sense for us to put our efforts into perfecting things that they've perfected? I think it's a really good example. So it's something that we can always strive towards, and it's not something we should think we can't do because practice makes perfect. Yes. Um, just during your talk about the lesson, I think it's just like um, it, it almost discredits the Dharma as well because, like, different people have different propensities, and there is a teaching for everyone. You know, like, if you're very lazy. If you're very ambitious, or if you're very practical, or whatever it is, there are practices and teachings made for you. Um, yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. yeah, there isn't. You can seek out something that's just right for you. There are so many different teachings and so many different deities you could rely on. One time in college, I think we were in some classroom, we were talking about um, spirituality, I guess. And I was talking about. Uh, enlightenment and um, you know enlightenment being the freedom from suffering and the perfection of all perfect 
and good qualities. And uh, another classmate, maybe she didn't have much background in Buddhism. She looked at me confused and she asked me like, do you really believe that? And I, I was so shocked, uh, but maybe because I grew up in such a different cultural context. I said, yes, <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> I was raised in the Dharma Center. And like, well, she didn't know that, but it's like, for me, it's a given because I have seen so many examples. But for other people, it might seem like such a strange idea and almost an impossibility because they haven't seen many, maybe they haven't seen many examples. So therefore, it shows that, you know, they have a saying, seeing is believing. Um, I think it can help to have an example or to have a role model so that we have something to work towards. And when we see that someone has accomplished something we want to accomplish, not only does it inspire us, it also tells us that it's possible and that we could do it as well. And so that can be helpful. So to continue our discussion of bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta, uh, the compassionate intention to attain Buddhahood in order to establish all beings in Buddhahood is like one side of a coin and or like one wing of a bird. Whereas ultimate bodhicitta is what helps to guide or steer that compassion wisely. About ultimate bodhicitta, um, Rinpoche states, up till now, we have been discussing relative bodhicitta, the compassion wing of the bird, you could say. Now, we'll go on to look at ultimate bodhicitta, the wisdom wing. We need to develop both if we wish to fly. Real wisdom or ultimate wisdom is not just knowledge in the sense of collecting information. It is much deeper than that. It is an experience of the way things really are, an experience of ultimate truth. It is an understanding, not just in an intellectual way, but deeply, experientially realizing the way things are, the way you are, or what you are. It means realizing or awakening to your true nature and experiencing this completely. Wisdom and compassion are closely linked. And as long as we're lacking wisdom, our compassion will be incomplete. Sometimes our wish to help is not really motivated by compassion for the other person, but by our own need to feel good or to feel important. In a way, that's all right. Without wisdom, this kind of weakness is inevitable. It's natural, we are all selfish. If I say I am not selfish, I'm either lying or deceiving myself. Without wisdom, I can't be anything but selfish. I think it is important to understand and acknowledge that we as worldly beings, or in Buddhist terminology, samsaric beings have weaknesses and are selfish. We have some compassion and kindness, but also we are selfish. When I can fully accept my own selfishness and understand that there is likewise selfishness in everybody, then I am actually being honest and realistic. And then I won't be so shocked when somebody behaves in a way that is a little selfish or unkind. Often we have unrealistic expectations, expecting people to be always nice and kind. For example, sometimes people visit Buddhist centers, expecting everybody there to be peaceful, kind, and compassionate, because that's what Buddhism teaches, isn't it? But the people in the centers are not always like that. <laughs> of course not. People come to Buddhist centers because they want to become peaceful, kind, and compassionate. If they were already like that, there would be no need for them to come to centers. In fact, there would be no need for Buddhist centers. As long as we are in this unenlightened state, we'll have these problems. 
That is why we want to change. And that is what we need to work on. We need to understand and to accept this. Otherwise, we'll expect too much from ourselves and from others. I believe that the necessity to overcome our self-centeredness is the central message of all major world religions. What are the characteristics of people generally considered holy? Highly learned people are not necessarily holy, nor are those who are powerful or materially successful. I think that those who are thought of as holy all have in common the characteristics of unselfishness and generosity. They have been able to transcend their self-centeredness and are therefore able to give to others. The ability to transcend our self-centeredness can come from the wisdom of knowing ourselves, knowing what and who it is we call me. This is the most important practice and essential search because as long as we are confused about who or what we are, the nature of our existence or the nature of reality, we will continue to have problems and suffering. As long as we have the exaggerated and distorted sense of self we have at present, we will inevitably be self-centered and selfish. Our way of reacting and behaving will be from the point of view of me at the center of my world and me and other. In a way, we're confronting everybody and everything. It's either good for me or not good for me. My friend or not my friend. Then we react accordingly. I want it or I don't want it. I run after it or I run away from it. I try to hold on to it or I try to push it away. When we are repeatedly reacting like that, then our experience consists of little else but fear and clinging. The cycle of repetitive reaction based on attachment and aversion is called samsara. And the only way out of it is through wisdom. It is difficult to express or explain what is meant by the wisdom of understanding the nature of reality because it must be directly experienced by each person for himself or herself. And that is not such an easy thing to do. To experience it fully would be to become enlightened. Nevertheless, it is really the only way we can get to the root of our fear and insecurity. If we can deeply understand the nature of reality, we will realize that there is no need for fear because we will find that there is nothing in us which can be destroyed. We will see how the body is comprised of parts such as the five elements, which are always changing and which will naturally dissolve. If I search throughout my body, I can't find anything I can point to as me. And what is my mind? The mind is my experience of the here and now, and it can't be grasped. It would be like trying to catch the wind or hold on to flowing water. The mind is a beginningless and endless continuum, changing moment to moment. You could say it is already dying each moment. So what is there to be destroyed? To experience this clearly is to understand that there is nothing to fear. It is a little like realizing that there is no need to feel insecure because there is no such thing as security. If you understand that there can be no security because there is nothing to be secured, then you can no longer feel insecure. When you gain that understanding deeply, there is no more fear. The concept of insecurity can only be maintained if there is a concept of security. The realization is a liberation. As we realize there is no need to react with fear and attachment, it's as though we've been freed or awakened from a bad dream. Not only that, because there is no longer any need to strive for my own gain, genuine compassion can arise. If I have nothing to fear and therefore nothing to gain for myself, then I am free to work solely for others. If I don't have to worry about my own problems, then I am free to help others overcome their problems. This is the real compassion that comes out of wisdom, the wisdom and compassion in union. This is the ideal we are working towards, the ultimate bodhicitta.
So those are the two aspects of bodhicitta, both relative bodhicitta, which is uh, both aspirational and applicational bodhicitta, as well as ultimate bodhicitta. Dza Petra Rinpoche also elaborates on bodhicitta in his Essential Instruction on Refuge and Bodhicitta, which is on page 11. of the handout packet. The first few pages, um, the first few pages, hmm, let's see. Well, I can mention this much. I might pause before we get too far into this because we've got about five minutes. Well, <laughs> it will soon be 12, but the first few pages of this instruction um, discuss taking refuge. And um, we actually didn't get a chance uh, to look at it yesterday. So maybe we could <laughs> spend a little bit of time looking at it because our current, um, our current discussion is going to focus on um, page 14 at the bottom where he begins with generating bodhicitta. So actually, instead of going into that, Maybe we can take a little bit of time to look at um, his instructions on taking refuge. So, especially since a lot of you are wanting to take refuge. In fact. One, two, three. So three people here. Two people are going to be taking refuge. So maybe it makes sense to look at this. So let's see here. Yesterday, we did go over um, the objects of refuge as uh, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. That's what it glosses over on page 11. If we turn to page 12, here we have information on the Buddha and uh, some of the qualities of the Buddha. We didn't really get into this. In fact, it may be a little bit advanced. Um, usually when we think of the Buddha and we say, if we say the Chakara, um, the three bodies of the Buddha, we mostly just refer to um, the Dharmakaya, the Sambhokakaya, and the Nirmanakaya. Um, and that would be in Tibetan, the Chukwu, Wangpu, and Tukwu. So often you see, you see Tukwu probably the most, like here in the Tukwu, or Bardo Tukwu, in the Chukwu. The Tukwu here <coughs> refers, refers really to the, the manifested flesh body the human body. Uh, that's what Drupal means. But technically there are four, uh, the, the four bodies of the Buddha. So here they're listed, the first being the Svabhavakaya, which is a nature of phenomena, reality devoid of any obscurations. You could think of that as maybe even of a, if you could think, it's like even, even wider than the Dharmakaya. We don't often discuss it, but it's kind of like even more ever-present than the Dharmakaya. Uh, the Dharmakaya, which is the unceasing aspect of wisdom. I mean, they're both ever-present, but maybe this, I would, there's a word in Tibetan that I wish I could use, kepcheya, uh, meaning like it's, uh, if you were to categorize things, it's of an even greater category. So the Svabhavakaya, which is the nature of phenomenal reality devoid of any obscurations. The second, the Dharmakaya, which is the unceasing aspect of wisdom. The third, the Sambhokakaya, which is the self-appearing Rupakaya adorned with major and minor marks. And the Nirmanakaya, which appears in order to tame disciples who are to be tamed. Of which we have the most engagement with the Nirmanakaya. 
So it's believed that once a being attains enlightenment, they take on the, typically they say the three bodies of the Buddha, but you can also think of them as the four bodies. Also, the Buddhas are endowed with the five wisdoms. Um, and they would be the wisdom of Dharmadhatu, which is the inherent purity of absolute space, mirror-like wisdom, which is wisdom's unceasing clarity aspect, equalizing wisdom, which is the absence of attachment and aversion towards anyone or anything near or far, and then wisdom of discernment, which knows objects without confusing or conflating them, and the all-accomplishing wisdom, which effortlessly, effortlessly brings about the welfare of others. What I would like uh, to clarify are um, the opposite of these wisdoms. So the first one I know, one I know offhand happens to be anger. So the obscuration of anger, when it is purified, is transformed into mirror-like wisdom. And likewise, a lot of our obscurations uh, also <coughs> correspond to these which are listed here. If I can, I would like to tell you which, which of them are which. Mm. Maybe, yeah? Are these also related to the five Buddha families? They are. Okay. So let's see here. Okay. So I might have to get back to you maybe after lunch. I can do some research and let you know which obscurations correspond to which of the five wisdoms and are transformed into what. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure we would go over this part. Five obscurations. Um, let's see. Then, Bhattu Rinpoche moves on to the Dharma and um, how the Dharma, in terms of the Dharma, underst understanding Dharma to be the teaching of the Buddha has three types of divisions. Uh, it's kind of called the three baskets. So all of the teachings of the Buddha are, are divided into three categories. The Vinaya, uh, which is more or less the rules uh, for the monks and the lay practitioners. Um, and then the Sutra, which is a collection of summarizing the texts in which points are arranged in categories. Well, the sutra, so you often hear sutras, like yesterday morning, I read you the sutra of the request. Um, oftentimes they're kind of more like historical and they tell about events that the Buddha did or uh, teachings that he gave. And then the Abhidharma, collection for generating the wisdom that clearly realizes the way things are. And this is particularly uh, for study. So you could call this like uh, the Buddhist philosophy. Yeah. So then, the, um, you described as the sutras yeah. are uh, illustrative and uh, uh, other artists who are uh, teaching the right? Yeah. Okay. That's a good way to put that. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> teaching is better. Than sure. Uh, so, uh, so the sutras uh, are a collection of the Buddha's teachings. They're kind of like a precise recording of all the things that the Buddha said. Yeah. So would you yeah, yeah, yeah. and the other is yeah. more of the teaching to try to complement? No. And then the threefold higher trainings of the Dharma. So in case you ever heard that term, um, the threefold trainings, they would be the training in discipline, the training in meditation, and then the training in wisdom. And they all relate to the three types of, uh, you could say, Buddhist canon that we have.
And then for those of you who might be interested in this, uh, to know the specifics a little bit, uh, on page 14, we get into what the actual practice of taking refuge will be like, and then also the six specific precepts um, that one would be taking up when they take refuge. So here are some important things. Um, the three things to avoid. So having taken refuge in the Buddha, you should try not to worship any gods who are still bound within the cycle of samsara. In other words, you should try not to seek refuge in worldly things or mundane things to try to, to help you. Uh, once you've taken the three jewels as your refuge or as your protector, protectors, you're kind of putting your faith in them to help you. So it's better if that faith isn't divided. Then, having taken refuge in the Dharma, you should not inflict harm upon any sentient being. So that's actually a part of having gone for refuge. You try not to harm any being. And then, having taken refuge in the Sangha, you should not associate with friends who hold extreme views. This one, I think it might have had more, um, I would say, application at the time of the Buddha, when there were many different philosophical schools that were kind of like vying for power, or they were all coming up at the same time. And then they were different people, and some of them had pretty extreme views and pretty extreme practices. And so I think perhaps the Buddha, in trying to protect his followers, uh, were telling them maybe it's better to be with like-minded people. And then, uh, for the three things that one should do after taking refuge, practice according to the words of the Buddha, and then, without forgetting them, generate faith and devotion, and show respect even for broken fragments of statues and images of the Buddha. In fact, they say you really shouldn't put images of the Buddha or words of the Buddha on the ground or anywhere where you know people put their feet or even places where people sit. You should try to always put them in an elevated and clean place. This is to show respect uh, for the teachings. And then exert yourself in studying, reflecting, and meditating on the sacred Dharma. Show respect even for torn scriptures that represent the Dharma. And finally, respect the Sangha, who are followers of the Buddha, associate with virtuous friends, and treat even tiny pieces of yellow cloth as, an, as objects worthy of reverence. So all of these kind of, there's a common theme of trying to cultivate a sense of respect for the Buddha Dharma, um, since it is something that you're relying on to attain Buddhahood. And I guess we can just gloss over this final piece, since uh, when we return, we'll, we'll be looking at part two about generating bodhicitta. So the five general precepts would be, do not forsake the three jewels, even at the cost of your life. Even in important ventures, do not seek other methods. So like, if something is going really bad or like you want, you want a prayer or a charm, uh, try not to outsource or put your faith into something other than I guess, the blessings of the Buddhas. So you can always uh, rely on them and ask them for help. Do not interrupt your regular practice. That's very much about the discipline. And then encourage yourself and others to take refuge. And then pay homage to the Buddha of whichever direction you travel. Not 100% how to interpret that one, but paying homage to the Buddha, I guess, wherever wherever you might be. And perhaps even like if you do travel, if you go to Buddhist shrines or Buddhist temples, to always cultivate a sense of respect and homage for the Buddha wherever you might be. So that's a little bit about kind of what taking refuge might entail in terms of what feelings to cultivate or actions to 
Okay. <laughs> um, it's 12.05, so we're going to break for lunch, and um, I'll see everyone at 2. Oh, yes. Dedication. Page 7. Thank you so much. Much as we prepared downstairs. Yes, please, please join us, Davis. Thank you much. Please talk.